found his way back up to the CMS forum in Mayo this weekend, and he kindly agreed to come by and educate all of us on what we can do to control the cost of medical care in um, Colorado and the U.S. So without further ado, Mr. Harold Miller. So I'm going to stand up here, sort of semi-close to, to the green slides. You'll see we have some audio-visual challenges today. That is not supposed to be green. It's supposed to be white. So um, uh, maybe it reflects sort of the, the money, you know, the green green cost of uh, healthcare. So um, I'm going to try to talk about quickly about, uh, as Irene said, some of the um, uh, issues associated with how you address costs. And I'll, I'll start this really with. Um, I mean, this was the national healthcare debate over the past uh, several years, and I think the things that you're struggling with here in Colorado and other places is how do you actually get uh, coverage, healthcare coverage, for the population, um, and what's the right way to do that? But uh, part of the struggle behind that ends up being the issue of how do you pay for that? Um, do you raise taxes to pay for health insurance for everybody, or is there some way that you can actually? reduce the cost of health care to make that more affordable. And the challenge in terms of reducing health care costs is um, that a lot of people think that the only way that you can reduce um, health care costs is either to cut the amounts that doctors and hospitals get paid or to ration care in some fashion to deny people uh, care that they need. Um, the ideal is not to raise taxes, not to uh, cut fees, but to find some way to actually develop higher value healthcare delivery, lower costs and higher quality. Um, because if you do that, and if we can actually get healthcare at a cheaper cost, uh, people can afford it more often, uh, people are less likely to be uninsured, etc. So that's in some sense what I would call the holy grail. The question is, is it possible? And I have been, um, I guess, depressed in some time, some of my, some of my conversations with people with how they uh, think that there's no way that you can and, and I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think there's three major ways that you can reduce health care costs without rational. One is by keeping people well. If people are well, uh, uh, you don't have health care costs at all. Uh, second is that if they do get some kind of a health care condition, uh, chronic disease, uh, to be able to help them manage that condition in a way which uh, is less likely to um, uh, result in hospitalizations. Um, and by the way, for those of you who are scribbling, Happy to make copies of these slides available to you if you would, if you would like. Um, um, and the third is that if they do end up in the hospital um, for some kind or some other kind of acute care episode, that they don't get an infection, they don't get a complication, they don't get readmitted to the hospital, uh, which still happens today at very high rates. Um, and the nice thing about um, thinking about these things, these are all there are tremendous opportunities in all of these areas. They are all uh, ways that we could save money in health. And they are all also uh, improvements in quality. They're better for patients. And I think that if we were to uh, tell the uh, American people and the people of Colorado that what we were trying to do is to keep you well, help you stay out of the hospital when you don't need to be there, and make sure that you have a successful outcome when you do go, they would say, sounds pretty good to me. Uh, the question is, how do you get there? And um, uh, that cannot be done from Washington which is sort of the struggle, I think, that Congress and Medicare have, is that you can't make care better from Washington. It has to be done at the local level. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, uh, how to do that. And I thought I'd start by saying, are there opportunities in Colorado? Um, well, where would you look? I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, a quiz for all of you. What health care condition? represents the greatest hospital expenditures for both commercial insurers and Medicaid plans. Got one diabetes, heart disease. What? Cancer. Cancer. Maternity care. Biggest hospital expenditure for commercial insurers and for Medicaid plans both is maternity care. Um, what do you do about maternity care? You can 
convince women not to have babies as often. Um, what's the most common surgical procedure in America? Anybody want to take a guess? C-section. That's absolutely right. C-section is the most common surgical procedure. Um, we now have about uh, a third of the uh, uh, births in America are now delivered by cesarean section. Uh, that was less than 10% in the 1960s. C-sections are more expensive. They are actually worse for both mother and baby. Um, so an obvious opportunity to try to save money in healthcare in a way that actually benefits both moms and babies is to reduce the rates of C-sections. Um, and you end up saving a lot of money that way. So there's opportunities to do that. Uh, and Colorado had the sixth highest increase in C-sections um, over the decade between uh, 1996 and 2007. So, opportunities here. Um, next thing, uh, those with diabetes and heart disease were uh, uh, pretty close. Um, all of the chronic diseases are uh, second biggest category of expenditures for uh, both uh, commercial insurers and for Medicaid plans. Um, and what do you do about that? Well, in Colorado, you're actually relatively low in the rate of hospitalizations for um, these uh, chronic diseases, but there are states that still have lower rates than you do, so there's opportunities to be able to improve. And there's many examples, I cited infections, etc., that can be done, but I think there are opportunities, but a key point is they vary from state to state and community to community as to what those opportunities are. So what I'm going to talk about is if you actually want to take advantage of those opportunities and find ways to improve quality and reduce cost, what do you have to do? And I'm going to talk about the four things that I think have to be in place in any community to be able to make these things uh, work. So the first barrier that you run into if you try to do any of this is lack of data, right? I surprised you when I talked about cesarean sections and the rate increase in cesarean sections. Um, it is surprising for most physicians to know how often their patients go to the hospital, how often they go to the ER, how often they're readmitted to the hospital because nobody has data on those things. Um, so if you're going to do something about that, you need to be able to do it. And nobody knows if they go to this hospital or that hospital, how much they, are they more expensive, less expensive, etc. So it's kind of hard to control costs when you don't, when you don't know that. So there's reams of data out there, but turning it into some kind of actually usable, actionable information is really what's key. And so you have to be able to analyze that data to figure out where the opportunities are. And you also need to give some real-time feedback to people in the healthcare system as to how they're doing. And that's the other problem that we have with those data today, is that it's old. Is, we'll give you data three years ago, well that doesn't do me any good if I'm actually trying to improve, I need to know how I did last month. Um, and we have a lot of programs around the country, and the federal government is trying to do more of this, to do measurement of quality and to try to rank physicians in hospitals. But truthfully, it's actually a very high standard to get to at this point where you can actually come up with a measure that you can put up on a website and say how good somebody's doing. What we really need a lot more of right now is just the ability to go analyze data to figure out where some of these opportunities are and to help people in the healthcare system improve. So there's a group called uh, Prometheus, for example, uh, that is actually working here in Colorado to do analyses like this and uh, hard to see in the back, but basically, what that is, is a list of various conditions in healthcare, everything from congestive heart failure, COPD, diabetes, to hip and knee replacements. And what they do is they have a method of looking at data and saying, well, how much of the money being spent on that particular condition is what they call a potentially avoidable complication. So how often are people getting infections? How often are they showing up in the hospital when they shouldn't be in the hospital, et cetera? And what it shows, as you can just sort of see by scanning it over, there are some conditions that have very high rates of these potentially avoidable complications. And there's others that don't. So what those big, those dark, it's the dark bars on the top of it are the potentially avoidable complications. So for example, that tallest bar is diabetes. And it says for this particular population, there's a lot of savings that you could achieve for diabetes. You could also save a lot for those two bars on the left for congestive heart failure and COPD. But the numbers might be completely different in Colorado, they might be very completely different in Grand Junction from Denver. You've got to actually have the data to figure out what are the things that you should be working on. So my number one thing, function, that you need to have in the community to be able to do this is data and analysis. You have to be able to have the capacity to be able to look and see what's going on and figure out where the opportunities are and where they aren't. Why 
spend time chasing something where there's not a problem or where the savings is going to be very small. Second question that you face is, who should be accountable for trying to actually do something about the data? Now, we have typically in America viewed that somehow that's the job of health plans, is to figure out how to save money. Um, and up until a couple years ago, um, there was also a strong focus on how this was hospitals' job, to try to figure out uh, where these opportunities are. But if you think about my chart, and you say, so who is it out there in healthcare that actually figures out how to keep people well, how to help them stay out of the hospital when they don't need to be there, and make sure that they have good outcomes? There's doctors. This is both primary care and specialists. They're really at the core of this whole notion of accountable care. Um, but they need to have very different kinds of skills and relationships than they do today and what is typically taught in medical school to actually be able to take advantage of some of these kinds of opportunities and to think about how to manage populations of patients. So they need to be able to look at data like that and figure out how to change the way they're delivering care to reduce hospitalizations. They need to figure out how to work together better with other physicians to be able to manage care for patients who have multiple conditions. And they need to be able to work effectively with their hospitals to be able to uh, reduce costs. So for example, what kind of, what are these kinds of skills that physicians uh, may need to be able to um, uh, take accountability to sort of keep people out of the hospital? I'll give you my list of six. Um, one is that you have to have physicians who have enough time to be able to do good quality diagnosis, treatment planning, and follow-up. And today, we pay most physicians in a way that says, get in and out of that exam room as quickly as you possibly can, you know, um, and keep your hand on the doorknob, you know, so that you can get out quickly. Second is you've got to actually give the doctor some uh, resources to help work with patients to do patient education, um, uh, self-management support. Lots of times this is having a nurse who can actually spend time or even go to a patient's home to be able to help them. We don't pay for that in healthcare today. Um, third is the ability to be proactive. If you just wait for the patient to come to you with a problem, you're probably waiting too long. You've got to be able to identify people problems early and intervene early if you want to be able to save money. Fourth is you have to figure out who are the high-risk patients and how do we actually target our resources on them. You've probably heard this line about how 20% of the patients result in 80% of the costs in healthcare. Well, figuring out who those patients are um, is very important. Um, fifth is to actually have physicians working with each other, uh, coordinated relationships. And number one, top of the list for me, is starts with that issue of data. Because you've got to be able to have, to understand whether you're doing well, whether you're doing poorly, et cetera, if you're going to be able to get better. Now, all of those skills and capabilities exist in every community in America, and they exist everywhere in Colorado. But we have invested most of them today in health plans and disease management who work most of the time completely independently of physicians to be able to try to do stuff for the patient. So you see your doctor today and maybe tomorrow some health plan calls you and says we're going to talk to you about how you're doing. They don't talk to each other to be able to coordinate that care. We have a lot of things going on here and elsewhere around the country to try to create what are called patient-centered medical homes, which give some of those capabilities, money and support for the doctor to spend more time, to have a nurse, to be able to create a registry to be proactive, but they don't really do all the functions necessary for this true accountability mode. You've got to have, if you're going to have different kinds of accountability in some of these different payment models I'll talk about in a second, you have to have the ability to be able to think about, so if I hire a nurse, what do they have to, what kind of outcomes do they have to achieve in order to be able to offset the cost of hiring that nurse? How many hospitalizations do they have to prevent, et cetera? When am I going to get those savings back? Um, how do I target resources to make sure I'm getting the biggest return on my investment? So it's really important to try to give physician practices all of those capabilities. Now, it doesn't mean that every individual doctor has to have all those capabilities. Doctors are supposed to be taking care of patients, but they have to be able to work in a physician practice or in a health system that can provide those kinds of supports. And in some cases, I think in the future, health plans may actually provide those capabilities to physicians, but we have to be thinking about how to get there. So that's the second box, is being able to have more value-driven delivery systems, and starting with giving individual physicians um, those kinds of capabilities. Now, you can't manage, but you can't measure. 
So if you actually want these physicians to be able to do better, they have to have uh, data and information to be able to do that. This is an example, and you can't obviously see it, but this is um, uh, something the state of Maine uh, is doing to, for their physicians. Um, uh, one of the nonprofit groups there is actually developing dashboards so that physicians can get data on their patient populations. How often are they going to the hospital? How often are they getting certain kinds of surgeries like back surgeries that may be overused, etc.? Um, not for public reporting, but for feedback to the physician as to how they're doing so that they can actually manage their patient's care uh, better. Now, you give them all that information, you give them the right skills, you run smack into the healthcare payment system. Because the way we pay for healthcare today, doctors and hospitals make more money when you get an infection. Doctors and hospitals make more money the more often you go to the hospital. And nobody in healthcare makes any money at all if you stay healthy. What kind of an incentive is that? Um, so, um, number three on my list is you've got to get payment systems in place that actually reward physicians for doing the right thing rather than are there such things? Are there better ways to pay? Uh, yes. There's two basic concepts um, in healthcare payment reform. One is the notion of an episode payment. Is to say, rather than paying for you know separate fees and uh, everything, every time you get an infection, you get you get paid more single payment for the procedure or the hospitalization uh, that you went in for. Um, no extra payment whenever there is a preventable infection or complication. It's the exact same concept that every other industry in America has of giving a warranty, right? You wouldn't expect when you take your car to the auto dealer, they said, hey, we messed up your engine, you have to pay for us to fix it. So um, this sounded like a really insane idea in healthcare up until a few years ago when the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania started to do this. They started to offer um, a single price for the procedures that they did, um, including everything hospital, physician, and anything related, any kind of related complications or readmissions. And they started doing this with uh, cardiac bypass surgery, and they have been systematically expanding it since to a whole series of other areas, including maternity care, for example. Um, and they've seen dramatic improvements because the way they're being paid now are, is supports better quality care. So these are results in 18 months for uh, bypass surgery. Um, and again, you probably can't read that, but not little itsy bitsy improvements, but 20, 40, 60 percent improvements in complications, infections, readmissions in a system that was already viewed as high quality to begin with. Now, the myth that has developed, particularly in Washington, is that only big systems can do things like this, that you have to be, you know, a big integrated healthcare system in order to do this. But the earliest documented example of anybody in healthcare giving a warranty was a single doctor in Lansing, Michigan, orthopedic surgeon, who said, um, I'm going to get, I'll give you a two year warranty. I don't care. Anything goes wrong with the shoulder and the operations I do, I'll fix it free of charge. And it's studied in the literature, doctor made more money, hospital made more money, and the health insurance plan paid less because all of a sudden there was an ability to eliminate all the unnecessary stuff that currently raises, raises people's revenues and make sure that the quality was better. So it can be done by everything from individual docs all the way up to big systems. Now the problem with the notion of episode payments, because a lot of people are in fan of, well, let's have episode payments for everything, if it's such a great idea. The problem is that it um, doesn't do anything to reduce unnecessary episodes. So if you've got your patient with emphysema, you don't want them simply to every time they go to the hospital to have a good outcome. You would like to have them go to the hospital less often. And you'd like to have people getting less of some of the kinds of heart surgery and back surgery that we know are being overused in many places around the country. So the second big idea, if you will, is uh, what I like to call comprehensive care payment, which is a single payment for um, everything that you need for a particular condition or set of conditions that you, as a patient, have. So that now there is an incentive, basically, to try to keep you out of the hospital. Now, a lot of people call this global payment. I don't like the term global payment because I think the patients are going to think that we're sending them off to India or Thailand to get their surgery. You know, I know what a global phone is, so I figure, you know, global payment must be sending me someplace else. Um, 
Now, if you've been in the healthcare system for a while, um, you immediately people say, oh, this is capitation. We know capitation is a bad thing. Um, there were health payment systems back in the 1980s and 1990s that still exist um, in many places, including here, um, where, you, where doctors and hospitals got paid a single amount per patient. The problem with those systems was that, for example, you got no additional revenue if you took on sicker patients. So it was a real disincentive to take on sicker patients because sicker patients do cost more. So the idea is to fix that, and under this notion of a comprehensive care payment, that you actually have a risk-adjusted or severity-adjusted payment. If you take on sicker patients, you should get more money to be able to take on uh, the management of the sicker patients. Second big problem with capitation systems was that if you've got the unusually expensive patient, that million dollar cancer case, case, case that shows up on your doorstep, no more money to take care of that. The idea is that's, that's an insurance problem. That's not a doctor problem. So you should have limits on how much risk for unpredictable events doctors and hospitals have to take. Third problem with traditional capitation systems was that um, no incentive for quality. If you deliver good quality care or bad quality care, you got the same exact amount. So the idea is to have bonuses or penalties. But two very good things about capitation systems and those who practice under them today like is that, first of all, it is the only payment system that actually rewards you for keeping your patients well. Because you still get paid even if you keep your patients well. It's a good thing, you gotta keep that. The other thing that people really like about capitation systems is the most flexible system. You're not restricted by what some health plan says they will pay for, what they won't pay for, how much they'll pay for it. You have the flexibility to figure out what's the right combination of services for a particular patient. So that's a good thing to keep. Um, this is being done by um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts uh, through something that they call their alternative quality contract. Um, single payment for all the costs of care for a population of patients. It gets adjusted every year. If you get sicker patients, you get more money. Uh, and there's a quality bonus, so you get more money if you do well. It's a five-year contract, which is really an important feature of this because it says that you have the ability, if you actually invest in prevention and other kinds of systems to keep your patients well, you'll be able to reap the benefits of that rather than having the health plan take it back uh, next year. Um, they've been giving lots of analytic support. This is this data issue, and analytic support to these practices to be able to participate. And they have very broad participation systems, big systems, but also they have one 72 primary care physician independent practice association participating. So lots of people can participate. And they just released their first year results a couple months ago, and they've seen very significant improvements in quality um, and reductions in a lot of these things like readmission rates and ER visits. Uh, so it, it's 